presidents have certain uh, objectives, certain roles that they play, not as specifically defined as Congress to be sure, but certain roles and Lincoln sought what um, sought to justify it publicly according to the constitution. So he saw that as not optional, but essential that rulers justify what they're doing according to the fundamental law of the land, which is the consent. It expresses the consent of the people at large. Hi, this is Tony Williams, Senior Fellow with the Bill of Rights Institute, and we are pleased to bring you another episode of Scholar Talks. For this episode, we are very honored to have a distinguished scholar and a friend of mine, uh, Lucas Morell, who is going to speak about his new book, which is called Lincoln and the American Founding. Uh, professor Lucas Morell is a professor of politics at Washington and Lee University. He also teaches at the master's program at Ashland University in Ohio and at several different high school teacher workshops, including many BRI programs. Mm -hmm. He is the author of Lincoln's Sacred Effort, Defining Religion's Role in American Self-Government, uh, editor of Lincoln and Liberty, Wisdom for the Ages, and an editor of several fine books on Ralph Ellison. His most recent book is Lincoln and the American Founding and is the subject of today's discussion. Lucas, thank you for joining us. Thanks uh, for inviting me, Tony. Right. Well, before we get started, I, you know, I just really want to uh, sing the praises of this book. You know, I, I really love this book uh, for, for a number of reasons, and, and I'll share with you just, just two of them. One is, you know, in an age where so many 900 page tomes are being published and definitive biographies, magisterial books, you know, you've taken a really important subject. Uh, and condense it down to what about 125 pages or so and and it's readable and and it's engaging and, and you can read it you know in a day if you sit down and and provide a little time for for musing about all the great ideas in this book uh, but it, it's a wonderfully brief um, examination of the topic and 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 that's meant very much as, as a compliment and, and the other thing that I think is so important about this book uh, is, yes, it's about Lincoln's political philosophy. It's about uh, his relationship and uh, the ideas of the founders, uh, as well as a, a bit of statesmanship, as we'll explore. And, and yet is also um, a civics lesson, right? Uh, I, I thought that that was the, the best part of uh, reading this book personally is that I thought, you know, as any citizen, any, any person walking away, uh, you know, a teacher or a student, but or, 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 an, or an average citizen walking away from this book would would know just a, a lot more about uh, not only the, the principles uh, of the American regime, uh, but, um, you know, what it means to be an American, right? And, and as there's so many debates today about all these things, uh, it really lends a voice uh, to that subject at a really important time, I think, in our history. So, so thank you for this really fine book. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, that's a better introduction to the book than I could probably <laughs> offer <laughs> if you gave me five minutes to, to prepare. Um, I, I am glad that you saw that it wasn't just a, a book about um, theory, even though I think it was uh, written fairly uh, in a fairly accessible way. Uh, but it's intended for the lay reader who has an interest in old things, old things like Lincoln and even older ones like the founding. But uh, this series by Southern Illinois University Press, it's called the Concise Lincoln Library Series. It was intended to be written by, believe it or not, academics who could speak plain English <laughs> and, and give the latest scholarship, but from their particular uh, vantage point on an, uh, a niche is probably too narrow, but on a specific aspect of I think are arguably the most iconic president that we've ever had, uh, even more than George Washington. Um, and so uh, the a quick genesis of the book, they asked me for a different book. They uh, emailed me and I had never spoken with them. They said, hey, we want you to do a book on Lincoln and civil rights. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I've been teaching Lincoln for a long time. That's kind of not my thing. <laughs> In other words, we talk about civil rights, but but for Lincoln, there was something more important. And I said, would you would you consider a book for your series on Lincoln and the American founding? And they said, ooh, what's that? Let's talk. And that's what led to the book. So I had the, the chutzpah 
of uh, daring to say, well, not your plan A, but how about this plan B? And they were fantastic to work with. So the, the series is intended to have books that are short, accessible, but scholarly. And even though they said it was scholarly, they really limited what we could put in the footnotes. And so I, it was like lopping off limbs. I, the book was actually much longer than, than it is. And a, a good portion of that were, you know, as you know, academics have the conversation and arguments in the footnotes, mostly, not entirely. And I had a lot in the footnotes and I just had to chop those out to make, uh, chop those off to make word content. So as somebody, word count, as somebody told me, they said, look, this is, 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 a, is a primer or a primer on the subject. You don't have to say everything, Lucas. So the person who reads this book should want to go read more about Lincoln on slavery or the constitution or the declaration or Washington or original intention, the, the, the main chapters of my book. And so with that nudge, I started chop, chop, chopping away. And that's how we got it to 120 some odd pages. Right. Well, it's always great to have the backstory. Really, really interesting. And uh, <laughs> you're right. Uh, I was going to say it's part of, it, as, as you mentioned, part of a, just a remarkable series. I have several volumes myself on, on the shelves I'm looking at. And uh, I'd, I'd start with with your book, uh, but then okay. and but then advise our viewers to to pick up a few more uh, volumes because it's really quite good. So, Excellent. All right. Well, how about we start the interview then? So, um, so your wonderful new book focuses really on Lincoln's political philosophy, as we've said, and how it's rooted in the the natural rights principles and and constitutional self governance of the founders. Can you briefly explain those principles uh, of a free society uh, for our viewers by way of introduction? Sure, and I'm sure we're, I'm, I'll, I'll sound repetitive as we go on because as we'll see, I will go back to the same things because Lincoln goes back to the same things. And fundamentally for him, uh, the great question in the 1850s, what we call the antebellum period right up to the Civil War was how Americans ought to understand the purpose of their regime. And in light of that, what the founders thought the purpose of the regime was. What did they think they were doing when they you know, declared and fought for and secured independence from Great Britain? Was it simply uh, to throw off tyranny um, or, or, or what was supposed to replace it? And so what Lincoln believed was central to the regime was something he found at, uh, in the year of our birth, which was he dated to July 4th, 1776, the day we explained to ourselves and the world why we were taking the steps that we were. Here we were a people already at war with Great Britain for over a year, and we finally formally decided on July 2nd to uh, resolve to be uh, independent and free states. Uh, and then two days later, we explained uh, what all that entailed. So Lincoln found uh, encapsulated in the Declaration of Independence a few key principles or ideals uh, that were essential to the foundation and operation of a free self-governing society. Number one, and for him, it was the central idea of America, is the idea of human equality. That great statement, all men are created equal. Uh, but of course, that invites the question, equal in what way? Um, I know you fairly well, Tony, and you are not a small man, you are taller than I am. So we're clearly, did the founders talk about stature, is equality in beauty, equality in intelligence? What, what, are, what do we mean when we say all men are created equal? Well, part of that um, is equality in the natural possession of rights, what we call or sum up as individual rights, what the declaration sums up as, right, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the idea of equality uh, human equality, the idea of uh, the rights of uh, the natural rights of every individual, that you possess these, regardless of what government does, these are things that you possess simply by being human. And then third, I would add um, that the Declaration says, uh, uh, in a way, as a result of human equality and the equal possession of rights, is that nobody is born the natural ruler of anybody else. And therefore, if any person or persons uh, decide to tell somebody else what to do and punish them if they don't, um, you have to get their, their permission first. The declaration calls government by consent of the governed. So equality, individual rights, and consent, I think, are, uh, are, are the, the, the key principles that Lincoln drew from the declaration, that he drew from the founders. And I think um, 
You don't have to read long in Lincoln to see those as central to his way of thinking about uh, the American uh, regime. And so while your book is about these political ideas, these ideals, uh, Lincoln's ideals seem really inextricably linked in many ways to his virtuous statesmanship, right? Of, of prudence, of, of moderation, of, of restraint. And, and, you know, those virtues definitely come out in the book as you talk about, you know, his presidency and, and his statesmanship. Yeah, so now we're moving, as it were, from the realm of, of abstraction, right? We're moving from ideas and principles to, well, how does this thing actually work in practice? Okay, so what, what, what does this look like in practice, whether it's the machinery of government itself, principally the Constitution, um, or the actual exercise of political authority by the rulers themselves? And so for me, it's no surprise that when you get Lincoln actually into power as president, you have someone who, and this is a debatable point uh, uh, to be sure, uh, but someone who at least in his own understanding is operating within the constraints of the fundamental consent of the American people. And that's not elections, that's their constitution, okay? Uh, and the constitution actually superintends elections and it's supposed to superintend or channel uh, or restrain the exercise of authority. Now it's, it's, it, counterintuitive, I like the way you put it, it's counterintuitive to think of the exercise of power as something that's a restraint or a limiting or moderating thing. Uh, but Lincoln thought, uh, he understood that what the founders put into motion constitutionally was precisely a form of government, or if you will, forms, because it's at the state as well as the national or federal level. They actually intended to um, channel political power in such a way that it would not be abused regardless of who was in power, okay? And so Lincoln as president at a time of national crisis, of course, exercised power in a way that at least he thought was um, uh, limited by what the, what the authority of the American people gave him, not just by election, but by the constitution. So what, a power, what power did he have under Article Two of the Constitution, for example? And just to, name, name, just to mention one, uh, uh, perhaps the most obvious example is what Lincoln did with regards to slavery during a time of war. Uh, it was different than what he did when we were not at war, which admittedly was not very long <laughs> when he became president, but for a, year and a, for a month and a half, and as he set out in his first inauguration uh, speech, you know, he said that there was very little that the federal government could do about slavery where it existed, but he did get elected on a platform which had a plank that said the Republicans believed that slavery should not expand, that we should try to curtail it to where it was, and therefore in hopes that it would wither on the vine, as it were, and that's a longer conversation we can have. But the Republicans were definitely at odds with the Democrats on this question because the Democrats either wanted it to expand into future states, i.e. the current federal territories, or they were indifferent, right? And the greatest temptation was the indifference camp. And that was led by his longtime rival, his Illinois nemesis, uh, Senator Stephen A. Douglas, the chair until Buchanan kicked him off uh, over the Little Compton Constitution, uh, the chair of the Committee on Territories. So Stephen Douglas had the don't care policy, which is to say that the Congress shouldn't care what local populations, local white populations do regarding slavery in territories. It's none of Congress's business, okay? Uh, as long as they put it to a vote, that's the American way. For Douglas, the American way wasn't human equality. The American way, in his mind, the founder's way was um, local popular so sovereignty. Let the people decide, as he put it. And he meant not Congress, the people at the national level. He meant the people at the local level, whether state or territory. And so uh, that argument between Lincoln and the Democrats, those two um, branches of the Democratic Party, the, Demo the Douglas branch and ultimately the Breckinridge branch, um, that gave rise to an understanding of the Constitution. What does the Constitution empower our rulers to do? And Lincoln thought that uh, applying wisdom, right, prudence, politically for the good of the whole, he said, when it came to slavery, there was only so much a president could do. And very little, in fact, in a time of peace, in a time of war, he thought, hmm, as a fit and necessary war measure, as the Emancipation Proclamation put it, uh, you know, and in a time of actual rebellion and you know, at a certain time in the war, when it was, became necessary 
to draw upon what Frederick T Douglass called the sable arm, Lincoln thought, okay, in order for this to be constitutionally permissible, because presidents can't touch your property ordinarily, but in a time of war, hmm, for a particular constitutional end, he had to turn a humanitarian aim, freedom, liberty to three or four million black Americans, he had to turn that into a constitutional means for it to be legitimate. And that was very debatable at the time when he did it. Republicans lost in the fall elections of 1863, something we would think, oh, it's a slam dunk. Of course you emancipate. At the time, it was, it was tenuous constitutionally whether a president could do this. And you know he paid the price, or at least his party paid, uh, paid the price in the fall of 63. And um, the dissenter in uh, one of the two dissenters in the Dred Scott opinion of 1857, Benjamin Curtis, a New Englander, guy from Massachusetts, um, no friend of the South, he actually published a pamphlet, 80 some odd page pamphlet called Executive Power, where he criticized Lincoln for, you know, trying civilians in, in military tribunals and for issuing an emancipation proclamation. So you have a guy who's one of the two dissenters in Dred Scott who still thought what Lincoln did with the emancipation was not constitutionally proper. But Lincoln, as he made his way towards emancipation to bring this to a close, he thought that the only way he could do it is if he could find a way in the constitution that would allow him to do so. And he ultimately interpreted his war powers and that phrase actually doesn't exist in the, in the second uh, article of constitution, but generally speaking, the powers of commander in chief as well as his oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. He took, uh, he took undebatable of, um, duty of president, preserve the Union, and used a means, emancipation of slaves in rebellious territory, towards that end. And that was the best justification that he could find for it. Uh, but he could only do it if in his own mind and conscience and before the American people say, these are the reasons why he did it. And he did it in a way, I say, and I would argue um, that pointed to them that he didn't believe he just had uh, um, you know, all the you know, plenary authority to do whatever he wants. Go do good. No, no, no. Presidents have certain uh, objectives, certain roles that they play, not as specifically defined as Congress to be sure, but certain roles and Lincoln sought, what, um, sought to justify it publicly according to the constitution. So he saw that as not optional, but essential that rulers justify what they're doing according to the fundamental law of the land, which is the consent. It expresses the consent of the people at large. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, well, let's uh, step back maybe a little bit in time here. So Lincoln's early political thinking, although it stayed with him, uh, his thinking about the founding was, was really about preserving the rule of law through what he called sober reason, ordered liberty, uh, rather than the passions of, of the mob and mob rule. So, you know, why is this important early on in, in the development of his political constitutional thought? Yeah, that's an excellent question, uh, a perceptive one, because it's not something we talk a lot about. Uh, we, we don't read a lot about it, but the, the importance of means and ends, and I've given you already an example of how Lincoln sought to connect those two. The founders thought the same. Uh, in a way that the American way of political life um, has to see that the, the, the means, if not as important as the ends, are, are, are a really close second. <laughs> how we achieve our aims, the common good, specifically the protection of individual rights, how, do, how we secure justice is as important as the justice itself. I mean, that was the big the question about slavery is not so much did, did, did slaves deserve to be free? Yes, uh, almost everybody believed that at the time of the founding, even though we were surrounded by slaves, if you will. Um, the question was how? How do we accomplish this? And the example was set by Washington. Washington, who wanted that to happen, but said it had to be the product of laws. It couldn't be the product of, if you will, the Underground Railroad. Uh, even though uh, I, I believe there is some evidence to, that shows that Washington did free uh, a slave or two when he was, it was either New York or Philadelphia, I believe it was in Philadelphia, where he quietly allowed uh, a slave or two to stay and it, definitely not public. 
Um, it was not something he would encourage. Um, and again, that's, that's a whole a subject for a whole other uh, conversation. Um, but, but the idea here is that, uh, how to put this? Uh, uh, the American way of political life has to be a way where the means we adopt have to be consistent with its ends, okay? And what is the fundamental means? Um, if the end is securing people's rights, the means are by consent. So the question is, what does it mean to be ruled by consent? When we think of consent today, we, you'll hear you know, stuff like, oh, government needs to be transparent, government needs to be accountable. Um, it's the people determining who their rulers are and if their rulers don't do a good job, they can kick them out. If they do a great job, they can keep them in power. Uh, but I think something more fundamental is at stake. And what that fundamental thing is, is to rule yourself by consent or for a community to rule itself by consent is to agree ahead of time that the only good rule is reasonable rule. It's not mere self-determination, okay? It is, uh, if it was just that, then, then majority rule would be it, popular sovereignty, Stephen Douglas, and that whatever the majority says goes, right? The voice of Vox Populi, Vox Dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. And you know, what about the rights of the minority? So the idea is that consent is really the enshrinement of the understanding that we ought to rule ourselves according to our reason uh, to rule by consent is, is, to, is to submit myself to constitutional rule, that we don't rush to exercising political authority, that it happened as a result of a deliberate, if you will, slow and mediated process. That's why we have separation of powers. That's why we have staggered elections. And so to rule ourselves by consent is to rule ourselves by reason rather than by passion, the, the emotions of the moment. Uh, those things can turn us into a mindless mob, even though individually we're sensible people. Uh, so, so the idea of consent as is conducive of reasonable rule, right? This is how um, the means of constitutional self-government are most conducive of its ends. And when we're not ruling ourselves deliberately, rationally, when we are given to emotion, and, and a desire for swift justice, hasty justice, we're not as likely to achieve our end in, um, in, in that particular uh, uh, situation. And so I think um, uh, no time like the present for us to remind ourselves that uh, rule of consent, uh, uh, the rule of law, right? Order, uh, uh, the rule of, of law and order sometimes stated pejoratively that the rule of law is not, a, is not an optional thing, it is essential. Uh, it was essential as Lincoln understood it. He, it, how, how important was it? Uh, the, he called it political religion in 1838, right? In his early years in the state legislature, uh, in, in, a, in a speech called on the perpetuation of our political institutions, he says, we have got to practice this as if it was a religion. It doesn't replace revealed religion, but it's its own peculiar American civic religion uh, whereby we look at the laws and the constitution with the kind of reverence you would look at certain um, religious documents, if you will. Right, right. And uh, speaking of those important documents, he, Lincoln said that the Declaration of Independence was the standard maxim of a free society. He said it contained the definitions and axioms of a free society uh, and uh, poetically the, the electric cord Mm -hmm. linking together the hearts of patriots. And so why is the declaration so central to Lincoln's political thinking? Um, uh, simply put, it's so central because he believes it encapsulated the key principles that founded uh, our uh, way of government mm -hmm. and that set forth how we should operate uh, justly and legitimately. Um, if he had to boil it down to one of those principles, it would be human equality. He said that public opinion in this country radiates, you typically radiates from one central idea. And he said the central idea of America, this would be the, the Jeopardy uh, answer, although those answers are formed in, as a question, uh, it's, what is human equality, right? <laughs> the central idea of America. So that's the Jeopardy question. What is human equality? Lincoln, uh, this was so central to Lincoln because he thought, look, to the extent we depart from the principle of human equality. To that extent, we are no longer 
operating uh, democratically or uh, as, as Republicans small are. How else to put this? Uh, anytime you, how, how do you know if you're doing this? You're doing this if you make an exception to humanity. So if you do it on the basis of religion, Catholics don't have all their rights protected. Or if you do it on the basis of race or ethnicity, black people don't have all their rights protected or only have those rights that white people want to give them, but what they can give, they can also take away. Uh, that was Stephen Douglas's view. He said, oh, no, no, we're, I'm not saying that blacks don't have rights, but what I am saying is it's up to the majority of white people to determine what those are. And in New York, they'll get some that they don't get in, in Illinois. And in Illinois, they'll definitely get some that they definitely don't get down in Alabama or Mississippi. So Lincoln said, anytime we make an exception, look at what we're doing. It's not just bad for black people when we enslave them or allow their enslavement. What we are actually teaching ourselves royal we here, white people, as white people, if we were to continue to do this, what we're actually teaching ourselves is government doesn't exist to secure the rights of the citizenry. What government is, is simply a lever, a tool for whatever political majority happens to exist, gets at the expense of the minority. And Lincoln says, the fact that we're doing it against blacks and have been doing it for so long, when is it going to, we'll turn around and start doing this to Catholics. And when are we going to start doing it to immigrants, right? He says, and ultimately it won't matter what the color of skin you are. People will learn, whoa, what is the important thing? To be in the political majority. And I think if, if we get back to the idea that all men are created equal, something as simple but as profound as that, then I think that would be the, the, the stepping stone, the first one to, towards our recovering a common understanding of governing a very diverse people. And, and let's dial in on, on that a little bit more, right? That this, this equality principle and, and the contradiction of slavery. I mean, the founders in Lincoln had to deal with this problem of slavery that contradict the ideals of the American regime. Mm -hmm. And I, I know it's a big subject, right? Very <laughs> complex. But what was their view, Lincoln and the founders? What were their views and policies related to slavery? And how do they attempt to restrict that moral stain of slavery on the American regime? Okay. Well, that second part, uh, some people would disagree with. Uh, I, I don't disagree with it, but some, some people, and it's becoming unfortunately uh, increasingly popular for people to think that the founders didn't think slavery was a stain, didn't think it was, as people call it today, an original sin. I don't call it an original sin. I call it a pre-existing condition. Okay. Uh, slavery was not introduced by the American founders. It was a longstanding, unfortunately, racial, chiefly racial institution that dates back even further than 1619, believe it or not. Um, because it had been in this country for so long and associated with a particular race of people, uh, it became uh, intractable at the, at the time of our attempt to govern ourselves, to secure our independence from this global power, Great Britain. Um, it, was, it was something, as I put it to my students, we were unable in 1776 uh, through 1783 uh, unable to free, attempt to free ourselves and free American slaves at the same time. Uh, and, and here's, a, here's a, a, a quote that's so good that I, I dug it up in anticipation of, of something along these lines. Uh, in 1858, Lincoln had to explain to Illinoisans, for the most part, could care less about Black people. He was trying to explain how is it, you know, what kind of attitude should we have towards this institution that's still around? Does that mean we like it? That, does that mean we want it to spread? And Lincoln defending the Republicans was explaining, no, we don't want it to spread, but here is why it still exists. He says, we had slaves among us at the time of the founding. We could not get our constitution unless we let them remain in slavery. We could not secure the good we did secure if we grasped for more. And having by necessity, hold on to that word, submitted to that much, it does not destroy the principle that is the charter of our liberties, let that charter remain as our standard. So translation, and Lincoln speaks plain English, I don't know that I have to explain this, uh, but the translation is, Lincoln said, the time of the founding, they understood slavery to be two things, evil, but necessary. What do we mean by necessary? Did we have to have it? No, by necessary, what he meant 
it was in, it was too difficult to get rid of right away. But just because it's too difficult to get rid of right away, you don't pretend that it's not a bad thing. Okay. He once used the example of, you know, of, you know, coming to your kid, your baby in a crib and finding that there's a snake there coiled up around uh, adjacent to the baby. You don't suddenly thrust your hand in and grab the snake, although you'd be tempted to do so, it's your baby, and pull it out because in the process of trying to grab the snake, the snake might strike your baby. And so you've got to deal with the situation carefully. Okay, so if I don't pull the snake out right away, does that mean I should introduce snakes into everybody's cribs? Am I saying that I enjoy slave, uh, uh, snakes uh, sleeping with my kid? No, but I have to deal with the matter carefully. And Lincoln thought the founders wanted to deal with the matter carefully. So how did they indicate that, e that slavery was wrong besides many statements, public and in correspondence, uh, along these lines. And, and you get it from all the, the major founders, Washington, Madison, Jefferson, all slave owners, all thought it was evil, okay? So what did they do? They did two things having to do with the supply of slavery and its expansion. In terms of its expansion, the only territory owned at the time by the American people at large was the Northwest Territory. And so the Articles of Confederation and Congress and the first Congress under the Constitution passed what's known as the Northwest Ordinance. Article six said no slavery in this territory. So that was their decision at the, at the, at the outset. We're a republic for crying out loud. Slavery is the massive contradiction. L Lincoln called it the great behemoth of danger. And so we've got slavery. We've got to let the, sla the states deal with it. Six of the original 13 get rid of it gradually. Vermont, the 14th comes in with an anti-slavery constitution. It's clear they think slavery is wrong. They don't want it to expand. Well, what about the supply? The earliest, and this was a compromise in the Constitution, the earliest they could prevent the importation of slaves was January 1st, 1808. The Constitution doesn't mandate it. It doesn't say Congress has to ban slavery. It just says that's the earliest they could do it. Well, guess what? A slaveholder by the name of Thomas Jefferson was president a year before 1808. And in March, I think, February or March, he signs a bill banning the importation of slaves into the United States to take effect as soon as constitutionally permissible, January 1, 1808. To put more teeth into that bite uh, of that law in 1820, it is equated with piracy. And the only punishment for piracy is capital punishment, hanged by the neck until dead, as they like to say. And so the founders in the early years, Lincoln pointed out frequently, especially in the late 1850s, they put their stamp of disapproval, uh, disapproval uh, on slavery by saying no more slaves can come in and we will execute you if we catch you trying to do it. Lincoln is the only president, uh, president to hang a man, Nathaniel Gordon, for violating that 1808, 1820, those laws. Uh, he does so famously in February um, even when people were petitioning to uh, extend the person's prison term to life in prison, Lincoln said, nope, I'm going to make an example of this guy, and he has him hanged. All right, uh, so uh, to, to wrap up, you write that Lincoln argued that we should not just follow the principles of the founding because they're old, right? <laughs> but that each generation of Americans should follow those intentions and practices of their forebears that are worthy of their respect because they are right. Mm -hmm. And it just got me thinking about today's, you know, sort of contention and, and incivility. And, and so how can Lincoln's political philosophy and civic virtues help restore a little civility to our own public discourse at a time when many of these principles and you know the idea of America has really been kind of subject to a lot of debate recently. So how yeah. can we help restore that civility? Um, that, I think that is a, a question on the top of everybody, every good American, every decent American's list right now of things that we have to figure out. Uh, this isn't an option for us, this is essential. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when we've had, we just had this transfer of political power. Um, number one, uh, it's basically what we've been talking about this whole time is we, we would do well to reread Lincoln or read him for the first time for that matter, 
uh, get any good one volume edition of Lincoln's writings um, and look at how Lincoln spoke about political things, especially in the 1850s and 60s when he was a national figure. Uh, and so to, I would call that principled rhetoric. Uh, rhetoric has a, has a pejorative connotation, but by rhetoric, I just simply mean, you know, the, the arts, uh, art of persuasion. So how did Lincoln try to persuade people? How did he try to shape and inform the public mind? I say it's principled rhetoric. It's not simple, you know, sophistry. It's not simply just tricking people, deceiving people with words and then, and, and then doing your, your, your own will. It's, doing, it's persuading the public in a principled fashion. So to read Lincoln is to read the founders. To read Lincoln is to remind ourselves of the meaning, not just the words, but the meaning of the Declaration of Independence. And ultimately, I would say in short order, the meaning of America. Uh, we do that most famously by reading the great, uh, the great Gettysburg Address and, and the other. If the, if the Gettysburg Address is the Mount Everest, uh, K2 is the second inaugural address. So read those, start there. Uh, and there are others if you, uh, if, you, if, you, if you want suggestions. So principled rhetoric. And I would say, secondly, it's not just what, how we speak to each other. It's how we act. How ought we to act? And we talked about this a little bit before. How ought we to pursue justice? How ought we to pursue the common good? Um, how should we attempt to secure rights in a more capacious, more comprehensive way? Um, and honestly, the, 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 the way we, we, we have to immediately do this is to exercise restraint publicly as we assemble, what does the First Amendment say? To peaceably, split infinitive, to peaceably assemble, uh, to do so in a peaceable fashion, not to look the other way when mobs form and get carried away, if you will, by design or just by the heat of the moment in destruction of, of property and in some cases lives. We can't turn an, a blind eye to, that, uh, eye to that when we believe in the cause. It should not matter what the cause is and again, justice isn't uh, determined uh, in a town square by, by, by bullhorn. It is done according to the orderly, peaceful, sorry, slow, moderate, deliberate processes of the law and courts. Should we have protests? Absolutely. Should we have demonstrations? For sure. But in those demonstrations, and King, right, the king of this, right, the guy who rehabilitated the notion of mass demonstrations said that we have to do it in a nonviolent way. We have to do it in a non-destructive way. We've got to do it in a way where we are exercising the self-restraint that we believe is being denied us by institutions of power. Very good. Words of wisdom. The book is Lincoln and the American Founding. Lucas, thank you very much for uh, joining me today, uh, for joining us at BRI. Uh, and uh, thank you for all of our viewers for watching. Uh, if you like this video, please be sub sure to subscribe to our channel and also to comment below. We put out new videos on Tuesday and Thursdays, uh, exploring US history and civics in regular primary source close reads in scholar talk interviews and homework help videos for students. And please come and join our conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, for updates on how you can get involved with BRI. Thank you. Thanks, Tony.